Well, let's pray together and we'll get into our sermon today. Lord God, thank you for the chance to be here uh, to reflect on this passage that uh, frankly it does res- 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 bring up a lot of questions. It brings up a lot in our minds and we want to know. We want to know when you're coming back and yet you promise that we don't know the day or the hour, but I ask that you would help us through this message become a little clearer on what you have for us and that your purposes would be clear. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I have alluded to already, our our gospel reading today urges that we should be vigilant, that we need to be, as, as the people of God, ready for the return of Christ because he says, as I mentioned in the prayer, that the Son of Man is going to return on a day and an hour that you do not know and you are not going to expect. And chances are there's a good number in this fo- of folks in this room that uh, you either have said yourself or you know someone who has said that we are certainly living in the end times. Like, it's kind of the feeling is, is right there. Like, oh my goodness, Jesus could be coming back anytime soon. Like, these are all signs of the times, what we're dealing with in our culture, what we're dealing with in our world, what we're dealing with the pandemic. And surely we are living in times that do feel like the end. I mean, all the things that, are, that, are, that Jesus had prophesied, that, that would happen before his return, they're happening. We got a pandemic. We got earthquakes. We got up, we have rumors of wars and wars. We have all sorts of kind of global shifting and changing and uncertainty. And we're still feeling the effects of this pandemic, right? I mean, it's all like right in our face. And so, of course, I, we can easily sympathize with the position that Jesus is coming very soon. And I think we should have that position. Uh, that being said... I still think that many of us can sympathize with the sentiment of the psalmist who says, How long, O Lord? When, when are you coming back? When is this going to take place? And ever since the church was established, Christians in every generation, even right as early as Paul, I mean, you can see it in the letters that he writes. I mean, there's a real expectation like Jesus is going to come back soon. He's going to come back in the next at least maybe within my lifetime. I and mean, you can see that in the way that Paul's writing. There was clearly a expectation that Jesus would return sooner than later. Um, and I think we certainly have that same kind of eager expectation when something catastrophic happens, when something big happens. When those things happen, we think, okay, Jesus has to be coming back soon now, right? I mean... <laughs> Uh, maybe you, you probably don't remember. I mean, like probably. I mean, you think about the feeling that you had when 9/11 happened. Think about the feeling when the news uh, for me in New York that really grabbed our attention. Like things are shutting down. Like this is a serious thing, and we feel okay. He's coming back, right? And Christians were thinking this even 500 years ago, though. Martin Martin Luther, he had an expectation that Jesus would return at least by 1600. And it's not hard to understand why, because there was cultural upheaval. There was, he was on the very brink of the Renaissance. There was national, the rumors of wars and wars. I mean, there, was, there were nations who are contrary to Europe. They're, they're, they're coming up uh, from the south, right? I mean, they're trying to invade Europe. There's a very real fear of uh, national security. And then on top of that, there was religious upheaval. There was the whole Reformation that was happening. And he's just like, hey, the gospel is really important. And the, and the Pope, the vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on earth, he's like, I don't think so. <laughs> and he's like, he's talking about gaslighting, right? I mean, there is this, the actual representation of the body of Christ on earth is denying the truth of the gospel. I mean, talk about feelings of like, okay, Jesus, you got to do something about this. You got to come back. We have to make this happen. And so now we're in the year 2021, way past 1600. We're on the verge of 2022. We're a fifth of the way for the 21st century. And we, through like so many people, as we have talked about, we are wondering how long, how much longer is, is Jesus going to come back soon? Like next week, <laughs> like next year, when do expect it? And of course, there are those crazies that are out there. They're making their predictions like he's going to come back uh, on this date, on this year, and they have like a, you know, a group of people that believe that, and then they get it wrong, and they make it, they revise it again. They gotta look in their crystal ball. And th- never listen to that, of course, by the way. Um, but I think that sort of thing, and then this, the waiting can add to our cynicism, and we just start to wonder, is, is Jesus really gonna come back? And so let's talk about just how, how can we be ready for his return? It's been taking a long time. 
So how can we be ready? So we can do that by observing three things. Number one, believe like Noah. Number two, maintain vigilance. And number three, remain faithful. So number one, believe like Noah. On a parallel reading in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says this, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is indicating when he returns, it's going to be business as usual. People are going to be eating and drinking. People are going to be doing business, selling goods and services. People are going to be having their Black Friday sale. They're going to be having their Thanksgiving dinner. They're going to be having Christmas. They're going to be having family vacations. We're just going to, we're going to be on our commute to work. We're going to be doing all these things. It's just, it's just daily life. And that's the kind of environment we should expect Jesus to return in. And that is actually the historic Christian belief regarding the end of the world. The more novel beliefs about the rapture and uh, the mark of the beast and microchips being installed in your hands and your forehead or something like that all have, and all those are derived from things from the book of Revelation, but the most historic beliefs and theology about the end regarding this stuff is so much older than that. And this is what we really believe. We believe that, that all that's needed for Christ to return, for him to actually get back here and restore all things, all those things have taken place. Nothing more needs to happen. In fact, all the things that have been taking place uh, that he prophesied about have been taking place since his ascension into heaven, since the very start of the church. And so the end, Jesus said, is going to be like the great flood. It's going to be sudden. But it was less sudden to the few and even less sudden to the guy who was building the ark for what some scholars estimate to be between 55 and 75 years. I mean, he built a boat that was one and a half football fields long and a half a football field wide. And you ever, have, you ever think that he may have stopped and thought to himself, is this kind of, is this strange behavior? This kind of, was anyone, can I get, a, can I get some thoughts on this? <laughs> of course it was strange. He was kind of a weirdo. He probably got used to the, the uh, insults and mockery after about the first decade, if not earlier. Now, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for a long while, it may be hard to kind of take a step outside of yourself and look in, but we have to admit that we believe some strange things. We're kind of like Noah. We believe that God became a person, and then that person died on a cross, an ancient Roman crucifixion device, and then through that we have forgiveness, and we have life in heaven with God, and he's going there to prepare a place for us, and he's going to come back from the sky, and we're going to be, and he's going to change the whole world. I mean, this is like, this is some mythology kind of stuff, right? I mean, it sounds kind of strange, sounds kind of weird, but it's true. <laughs> this is all real, but to the outside observer, to the secular person, like, this is kind of strange stuff. That being said, when it does, uh, does indeed happen that Jesus does appear in the sky, as it prophesies in the Bible, the world's going to be startled, perplexed, and terrified. And by all accounts, they should be. But the weirdos are going to be excited because we're like, finally, <laughs> this is what we've been talking about. We're going to be surprised because we didn't know when he was going to come back, but we're not going to be shocked. So let's believe like Noah. Let's believe like him. Let's not be afraid to be weird. So I want to discuss something here for a minute before we move on. That being said, it, it is uncomfortable to have to maintain these beliefs in our modern day. So what objections to your faith have friends or family or acquaintances shared with you? And how have you responded? So go ahead and reflect on that a little bit, and then we'll come back and finish the rest of the sermon. So that's the first point, believe like Noah. Second point, we must maintain vigilance. So it is not enough to be weirdos. It, we must be countercultural weirdos who are vigilant. Jesus says it like this, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Basically, if you like these servants knew ahead of time, that your master was going to come home that night, you probably wouldn't like 
get all snuggly up in your bed and you wouldn't set, you wouldn't like put your phone on do not disturb and you wouldn't turn on the noise machine. I mean, you would be like, all right, we got to set a watch. We got to be ready for when he comes back. And as soon as you see him, you got to let us know. Like there would be vigilance there. And so when I was getting my master's degree, similar point, I had a professor who knew that we were assigned way too much reading. And he said that as much on syllabus day. And he knew that we would make choices to read some books and not read others. And he also knew that in order for us to be able to read his stuff, he needed to do something about that. And so what he did was that he would assign reading quizzes that would just be randomly assigned. We'd just walk in the classroom and suddenly, hey, it's a weird reading quiz. So you had to be ready. Like if you didn't, uh, if you wanted to sacrifice 15% of the grade, then you could not read. But if you didn't want to do that, you had to be ready and have read all of his material that he wanted you to do before class. And so did I in fact read his stuff more than the other classes? You bet I did. <laughs> and did I, of course, find myself one night finding I couldn't continue to read in one more, one more sentence. And then that was the, the very next day was when I got slammed with a reading quiz. You bet that happened. But he wasn't messing around. And the point is, neither is Jesus. Jesus is not messing around. We need to maintain vigilance and have faith and always believe, always be expecting, always be living and thinking with this attitude. Perhaps today, like maybe Jesus could come back today, could come back this afternoon. And I, I'll admit, like, that's not a thought that I have all the, all the time. Sometimes there are seasons in our, in our world that make that feel a bit more tangible than others. But there's a bit of tension, right? We see in this text that we can make note of the signs that he speaks of, like one who observes the seasons. He talks about the fig tree. If you can pay attention to these signs, you know that the time is coming, that he's very, he's very near. But there's also that aspect of surprise and suddenness, like you don't know when it's going to happen. But notice that both of these postures require vigilance. You have to be paying attention to the seasons, otherwise you will be caught by a surprise. You have to be paying attention, otherwise you will be caught off guard when he does come suddenly. So we need to be vigilant so that we're not, so we're pleasantly surprised instead of being shocked. All right, so here's another discussion question for you. It's easy to assent this to this idea, but on a scale of one to 10, one being not vigilant at all and 10 being super vigilant, how vigilant would you say that you are for Jesus' return? and why. Discuss that question for a moment and then come back and we'll continue our sermon. All right, so the first two points again, believe like Noah, remain vigilant. And number three, if you don't feel like you are super vigilant, maybe this is gonna help you. The third thing we should do is be, to be ready is to remain faithful. And faithfulness is simply what vigilance looks like in practice. So being vigilant, that's, yeah, that's good. But faithfulness is what vigilance looks like. So Jesus says, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, nor, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. So Jesus, he describes a homeowner who puts his servants in charge, each with their own household responsibilities. And the expectation of each, each servant is simply this, to be faithful in the work. Take care of the food stores, feed and water the livestock, tend to the home repairs, whatever. The master just said he's going to be back soon and he gave you a job to do, so you best better get down and do it. And keep doing it. Maybe he's gone a week, maybe he's gone a month, maybe he's gone a year. You just keep doing the job. So we need to remain faithful like these servants. We have to be careful to follow the three greats, the great commandment, the, uh, the greatest commandment, which is loving God, the great commandment, which is loving neighbor, and the great commission, which is sharing Jesus with our neighbors and those we meet. And our master, the master of the house, is going to be very proud when he returns to find us faithful to these things if we are inconsistent in doing them. And these are not high-profile activities, are they? These are just simply obeyed in our homes where we work, where we study, where we play. And yet all of our life, these three commands will never be completed. And neither will we fully master them. You're never going to master loving God. You're never going to master loving your neighbor. But if we remain faithful, and day after day, we're just getting up, showing up. We're being ready to love those who are in front of us, live out the fruit of the Spirit, live out the commands of God, 
and care for our neighbor in our various vocations and share Jesus with the people that he's putting in front of us on a regular basis, we're going to be ready. You're, you are vigilant when you're doing those things. You're being faithful. And soon enough, the master's going to come through that door and he's going to be like, man, the place looks great. Good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. But if you hear nothing else today, I hope you hear a few other things, but if you hear nothing else, don't be afraid. Because Jesus' return does not need to fill you with dread. Jesus is not coming back with anger. He's not coming back with fury. The last day is fundamentally a good day. Jesus is going to come in love, and that lo the, the heat of his love is going to purify and cleanse this world and make it something that's almost beyond recognition. The unkindness and the hurt, the injustice and the pain, it's all going to be wiped away in the fiery fury of his love. And when he returns, the world's going to cross a line. And when it does cross that line, there's going to be no going back. We're going to be finding ourselves in a new world, a new country, God's country. We're going to be secure in heavenly bliss in a resurrected, renewed spiritual body, able to enjoy all sorts of new adventures, all sorts of new things. And there will be always something new to discover, something new to delight in. And the former things are going to fade into the deep recesses of the past, almost into oblivion, so that we don't even remember what pain, suffering, and death even meant. As Jesus says, Behold, I'm making all things new. That's his promise. The world is going to be new. And so will we. No eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, but God has prepared for those who love him. That's what scripture promises to us. And as C.S. Lewis said, for us it's only, going to be, it's only going to be the beginning of the real story. All this life long we've lived is only the title page and the table of contents. At that day, the real story begins, where every chapter is better than the first. And you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper in to eternity with God. So get ready. He's coming soon. I'll pray for us in a moment, but first, uh, here's your discussion question for the wrap-up. What has your vision of the end times been characterized by? Has it been fear and turmoil or hope and renewal? And what would change for you if you chose to focus on hope and renewal? So let's discuss that in a moment, but let me just pray for us first, and we can uh, I'll let you carry on with the rest of your service. Lord God, thank you for the chance to be here and to hear this word, and to get a little bit more clarity, I hope and pray, about what you are doing and uh, how we can be faithful and vigilant, believing like Noah, be weirdos, who love God, love our neighbors, share Jesus. Lord, help us to be faithful in these things. Help us to be expectant for your return. And as we look ahead to uh, the season of Advent, where we remember your first coming on that first Christmas, we pray that you would also awaken in our hearts a desire that God, Emmanuel, you would come, that you would be with us, and one day, and that one day would be very soon. We ask for your coming, Lord, and we echo with the church and the spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.